Okay, so um, the next study that we are going to look at is Maguire's study, um, and that is looking at navigation related structural change in the hippocampi of taxi drivers. Uh, so, a few words in there we don't yet know. Uh, now, the hippocampus, that's the first word in there that you may not know. The hippocampus um, it is the Greek word for seahorse. Um, it is located in an area of your brain known as the medial temporal lobe. Uh, so in other words, this bit of your brain here, that's your temporal lobe. Um, and in kind of the centre of that, the middle of that there, so you can see it on this diagram here and here, um, you will find your hippocampus. Um, it belongs to the limbic system, which we've already talked about, and there's an additional diagram down here of the limbic system. Um, and it is what you call a bilateral brain structure, bilateral. Now that means that you have hippocampi, uh, so a hippocampus that is on either hemisphere, in either hemisphere. So you've got one in the left hemisphere, one in the right hemisphere. So the plural of this is hippocampi and the singular is hippocampus. Uh, now, the um, hippocampus and the limbic system are part of the old mammalian brain. Uh, so the hippocampus could be an old part of the brain which may have evolved to, to deal with navigation. Um, it's closely involved with behaviours that satisfy certain motivational learning and emotional needs, including feeding, fighting, escape and mating. Okay. Um, and the important thing really here is that the uh, hippocampi appear to undergo some structural changes in response to behaviours that require spatial memory, uh, some memory of um, like places, locations, things like that. Uh, now, it's important for you to know uh, the difference between grey matter and white matter. So when you look at a scan of the brain, uh, the grey matter you can see round the outside. Now grey matter in a living brain is a pinkish grey colour and it is um, usually uh, nerve cell bodies and dendrites. Okay, So uh, if you look at this diagram of a cell, which should be fairly familiar to you, uh, the cell body and the dendrites here, all of that is grey matter. Now, the lighter coloured part of the brain uh, is your white matter, and that's usually uh, your axons um, here. So the bits that are responsible for transporting information and sending those impulses on. Uh, now, the hippocampi appear to be larger in volume for males. Uh, now, interestingly, this could relate to um, kind of the historical role of males, perhaps, that, you know, males are um, historically supposedly hunter-gatherers who have to go out, uh, find the food, and then bring the food back. And obviously, you could go quite some distance, no GPS in the prehistoric time. Um, so, therefore, you would need good um spatial memory in order for you to remember where you uh, came from and how you got to where you currently are so that you can get back. Now there also appear to be special neurons in the hippocampus that respond to things like locations, directions um, and head movement. So this is partly why we think that this structure is important for spatial navigation um, and also I suppose it kind of links with um, the very stereotypical ideas uh, that you know men have better sense of direction and things like that. Uh, I am going to uh, share these slides with you because there are some really useful videos for you to watch as well and um, so I'd like you to watch each of these videos as part of your note making so watch this TED talk as it's quite interesting uh, but for now I'll just move on to the next slide uh, so some animals also appear to have larger hippocampal volumes in other words their hippocampus seems to be bigger um, so these are animals with territory, um, so they need to know where the bounds of their territory are and where the next animal's territory begins. Uh, and also remember some animals with territory, their territory can be, you know, hundreds of miles wide. 
uh, small mammals like squirrels who engage in food storage and may need to obviously remember where they're storing so that they can keep adding to it but also uh, so that they know where to get it so that they can eat. Uh, migrating birds, uh, so these are birds who will migrate to warmer climates during the winter months um, and it appears to actually incre increase even more so during the migration season. Uh, racing pigeons and also when we have uh, trained rats how to run a maze and then we create a lesion so in other words we damage their hippocampus they suddenly can't remember the location of places and things so they're, they're then struggling to run the maze um, so this suggests that the hippocampi are implicated in spatial navigation the hippocampus helps us to navigate and find our way around familiar and new environments, uh, which is why it's related to spatial navigation. Now, the important question here, though, is if the needs of our spatial memory change or increase, will the hippocampus change in order to accommodate this or not? Um, so, um, it's also important for you to know what plasticity is, brain plasticity, this is. Um, so, brain plasticity is physical changes that occur in the organisation of the brain um, as a result of experience. Um, so, that could be that um, for a number of reasons, and it comes back to the nature-nurture argument. So, some things... Um, in your brain may change in terms of their volume or their structure because it was predetermined that it was going to develop in that way or it could be um, that there's been some kind of morphological change because of the way that you've used that particular structure um, and there's quite a few um, instances of this so for example musicians have a larger hippocampus as well um, again I want you to watch the attached video uh, in your own time so you may want to pause this refer to the slides and go and watch the video but essentially Maguire wanted to find out um, whether these structural changes in relation to the hippocampus and spatial memory occurred in humans so to investigate the extent of structural changes or plasticity in the hippocampus of London taxi drivers as a result of extensive navigational experience was the aim okay so using london taxi drivers because london taxi drivers i'll explain why in a moment have an extensive um spatial knowledge and lots of navigational experience um but also um it is demonstrating this in humans because obviously they're going to learn this kind of navigational knowledge and they're going to continue to use it over time so what they also wanted to demonstrate or investigate was to see whether there's going to be a correlation between the length of time as a taxi driver and the measure of grey matter volume so what this part would tell us is it would help us kind of solve that nature nurture argument a little bit so it would enable us to see that actually if the longer you've been a taxi driver the more time you spend uh, navigating these spatial environments the more changes occur the more plasticity is demonstrated then actually that would suggest that brain plasticity occurs due to um, nurture rather than nature uh, so in order to investigate this uh, as i say we use london taxi drivers now they have to complete an intensive training course called the knowledge um, now in the knowledge you essentially are required to have a detailed knowledge of the 25,000 streets um, within a six mile radius of Charing Cross um, and a more general knowledge of the major routes throughout the rest of London. Now it takes roughly two years for you to um, attain this knowledge and there's also several tests that you must pass in order to become qualified as a London taxi driver this is for a black cab driver um, so there is a little bit of a documentary on this slide this one that's blank um, so again I'm going to share these slides with you 
because I'd like you to watch that as it is quite interesting, but it also just demonstrates the extent of knowledge that they must have in order to be a London taxi driver. So the sample. Now, uh, the sample had a group of taxi drivers and that was the experimental group. So 16 male London taxi drivers were used. Um, now, these had a range of experience. So they were licensed as London taxi drivers for anywhere between 1.5 to 42 years. And the mean time qualified was 14.3 years. Um, also, the average time uh, taken for this group to complete the knowledge was two years and also they all had a healthy general medical, neurological and physiological profiles. They then compared this to a control group. Um, now this control group, uh, there were 50 participants of the control group were used for a VBM analysis. I'll explain what that is in a moment. Um, and 16 of these 50 were then used for a technique called pixel counting. Uh, now, these controls were um, MRI scans that had already been done. Um, and so they were taken from a database. So the database was at the Wellcome Department of Cognitive Neurology, University College London. That's Wellcome with a double L. Um, now they were selected so that no females, no people who were left handed, no under 32s or over 62s and none who had medical, neurological or physiological health problems were included. So they were kind of age uh, matched, you know, the samples are the same ages. So they were all between 32 and 62. They're all healthy, all right handed. Um, and then mean ages and age ranges, like I say, were matched. Mean age was 44. Okay, so uh, this is a quasi experiment. So as I said, they had a range of um, experiences. So they did not become taxi drivers for the purpose of the experiment. So the independent variable is naturally occurring because that independent variable is whether you are a taxi driver or a non taxi driver. The dependent variable is the volume of the hippocampus. Um, now, this was taken at different um, angles, the volume. So this includes their anterior. So looking at the front of the hippocampus, the body, which is like the middle or the side profile of the hippocampus and the posterior regions, um, which is the back of the hippocampus. Now, this was measured using two techniques um, in an MRI scan. Um, so these techniques were VBM and pixel counting. Uh, now this was um, an independent measures designed for the VBM because remember there was 50 participants there um, but remember for the pixel counting where we had 16 participants those 16 participants were matched in terms of health handedness age and age range um, and um, the fact that they were all males with the experimental group. So then it becomes a matched pairs design just for the pixel counting. So um, they used an MRI. So we have looked at fMRIs previously. Uh, an MRI is similar, but an MRI is structural only. So when we looked at Casey's study and they used an M uh, fMRI scanner, uh, that shows you um, what level of activity there is. A MRI is slightly different as this uses magnetic fields and radio waves in order to demonstrate uh, the structures that are present. So that kind of scan in the corner is sort of what an MRI would look like. It's showing you what structures are there. Now, the two techniques that can be used to analyse these MRI scans are pixel counting and a voxel-based morphometry, otherwise known as VBM. <laughs> 
it's also worth you understanding what we mean by slices, brain slices. Um, so we, we talk in this study about um, the fact that we analyse brain scan slices. So in this study, they took 24 slices of the hippocampus. Six were anterior, 12 were body and six were posterior. Um, so this just shows that there are different kind of planes. Um, so you've got your coronal plane, which goes kind of uh, right down the middle axial which goes uh, horizontally and uh, sagittal which is kind of a side plane um, so actually um, these kind of different angles or you know uh, planes can be used to, to take those slices of the brain in order to examine the volume. So, the uh, MRI scans of the control group are um, selected from the structural MRI scan database at the same unit where the taxi drivers were scanned. So, the taxi drivers were all still scanned at that Wellcome uh, Cognitive Neurology Department. All the MRI scans of the participants in the experimental group were analysed with both pixel counting and VBM. VBM uh, measures grey matter volume, um, so a voxel, um, most of you probably know what a pixel is, uh, so a voxel is like a, a 3D um, pixel I guess, so a voxel is a 3D measurement of volume um, and this allows a computer program to essentially calculate the total amount of volume in a given area. Um, now this procedure um, also uh, normalise the scan to a template in order to eliminate overall brain size. So as well as kind of compare, comparing the hippocampi against one another to see, you know, is that um, larger or smaller as a hippocampus, they accounted for the variable of overall brain size. As if you have um, like a larger brain, you might have like larger structures as well. So that's what it means here when it says it normalises them against a template. So it establishes whether your brain size was larger than usual um, or larger than the average. Uh, so then this identifies differences in grey matter density. So the brains of the 16 taxi drivers were compared to those of 50 non-taxi drivers using this technique. The next procedure is pixel counting. Um, so a pixel is a two-dimensional measurement of an area. So it's essentially possible to calculate differences by looking at the 26 slices of the scan. Um, so 24 of these slices, like I say, were of the hippocampus. Um, six slices were um, the uh, posterior, six were anterior and 12 were body. Now, in terms of this analysis, um, these were analysed by one person, the same person, who is experienced in the technique and they were also a blind researcher. So in other words, they were not aware whether the um, hippocampus that they are looking at is the hippocampus of a taxi driver or of a non-taxi driver. So essentially this procedure allows us to calculate the total hippocampal volume. So in summary, how large is your hippocampus? Okay, so um, generally what we have found is that the VBM analysis showed differences in two areas of the brain. So taxi drivers had significantly increased grey matter volume in the right and left posterior hippocampi compared to controls. So in other words, the posterior, remember, is the rear part of the hippocampus. So you've got a diagram of it just there. So that's your posterior, that's your anterior, that's the body. <coughs> so the taxi drivers had more volume in this red area than the control group. In the controls, there was relatively um, a greater grey matter volume in the right and left anterior than the taxi drivers. Okay, so the control group uh, had more volume in the blue area and the experimental group had more volume in the red area. Yes. <sighs>
Uh, now, the pixel counting also showed us um, that there was no significant difference in the overall volume of the hippocampi between the taxi drivers and the controls. OK, so it's not saying that over time, if you're a taxi driver, your hippocampus just grows and grows and grows and gets bigger. And then you end up with an overlarged uh, and enlarged hippocampus. It's saying that overall, the volume is pretty much the same, but you seem to have volume placed in different areas. So it's worth saying that the controls had on these pixel counting scans greater anterior right hippocampal volume. So again, um, in the front, uh, but on the right side this time, rather ra rather than right and left. And the taxi drivers had significantly greater posterior hippocampal volume than controls. So this finding was the same as the VBM and the control group mimicked the VBM. Uh, controls also had significantly greater hippocampal body volume on the right than on the left. OK, uh, so just something to help you remember this potentially. Um, so remember that anterior is the front. So think of a pair of antlers. So they're on the front of a deer's head, uh, whereas posterior um, usually is a saying for uh, the behind, for your bottom. And the posterior is the back. So anterior, antlers, front, posterior is your behind. Um, so, in other words, just to kind of summarise this, um, depending on the scan, so the um, this is kind of your findings from um, a combination of both. So the um, control group had greater um, anterior volume on the um, pixel counting just on the uh, right side but also on the body um, and the taxi drivers left and right uh, posterior volume was greater. Now remember that they also did a correlation um, so they found that there was a positive correlation between the length of time as a taxi driver and the right posterior hippocampal volume. Uh, so this is the correlation that they found there. And this had a correlation coefficient of uh, 0 0.6. OK, so it is a moderate correlation. They also found that there was a negative correlation between the length of time as a taxi driver and the anterior hippocampal volume. So again, you can see there, it's quite a steady slope. So if we put that together with a previous finding uh, here, oh, yeah. uh, so this previous finding, which says that actually there's no difference in the overall volume, then this tells us that actually the longer you are a taxi driver, your posterior hippocampal volume is increasing and the longer you're a taxi driver your anterior hippocampal volume is decreasing so actually what this suggests is that um there are matters of volume from your anterior hippocampus that as you gain experience as a taxi driver become repositioned on the posterior of the hippocampus. So in fact, you're not kind of growing any volume, but that volume is moving, basically. Now, it's worth saying here as well that uh, data for one individual um, was actually removed from this part of the analysis. Now, the only reason for this um, is because he was an outlier in terms of the amount of experience he had. So he actually had 42 years worth of experience as a London taxi driver. Um, and then the person who was the next most experienced only had 28 years. So they decided that actually that jump from 28 years to 46 years um, was too great as it's almost 20 years. Um, and therefore he would be 
removed from the statistical analysis um, because he would have been an outlier. However, what they did look at is whether he would have still have been consistent with the general finding. And actually, the evidence was that he would still have been consistent. So he would have had greater posterior hippocampal volume and uh, lesser anterior hippocampal volume. So he still fit with the trend, but they just removed him from that statistical analysis because his experience was anomalous. Um, so just a kind of quick way to try and remember that, uh, that some of my students have used in the past is, uh, so the taxi drivers had the junk in the trunk because they had the posterior hippocampal volume, so it was all in the back, and the control group had it all up front because they had the greater anterior volume. So, in conclusion, uh, they essentially established that there are different roles for the um, posterior and the anterior hippocampus. Um, so that links with this kind of first conclusion here, that there are regionally specific structural differences between the hippocampi of licensed London taxi drivers compared to those who do not uh, drive London taxis. Okay, um, so you need to just know what those um, structural differences are. Uh, they said that the professional dependence on navigational skills in licensed London taxi drivers is associated with a relative redistribution of grey matter. So that links really with the um, correlation that you looked at. So the correlation suggested that um, the grey matter that is found in the anterior uh, hippocampus over time with experience as a taxi driver will be redistributed to the posterior. Now it can also be suggested that changes in the arrangement of hippocampal uh, grey matter are required due to nurture rather than nature. Um, and findings also indicate the possibility of local plasticity in the structure of a normal human brain, which allows it to adapt in response to prolonged environmental stimuli. So in other words, this provides evidence for brain plasticity. It provides evidence that if you are um, exposed to uh, a prolonged environmental stimuli, then actually this can um, affect the structures of your brain. Okay. So overall, um, essentially, this study suggests, uh, and I'd write this in your notes as well, that there are different roles for the posterior and the anterior hippocampi. So we think that the posterior is related to learning new spatial information and using previously learned information. So that could be why the taxi drivers showed that greater posterior volume because not only have they had to acquire all that you know the knowledge um they also have to continually kind of use it and refer to it um, when they're driving and also it's going to be added to so routes uh, are going to change there's going to be new one-way systems put in new traffic lights new roads are going to be built new landmarks all those kinds of things so it is a combination there in the posterior of learning new spatial information and previously learned information. Whereas we think that anterior is specifically related to just learning new spatial information, which is why I suppose the um, newly qualified or the more recently you were qualified, the greater your anterior was because you've just learned all that knowledge. Uh, so we think that the right hippocampus holds mental map and the left holds memories and events not dependent upon cognitive maps. Um, so then that could be why the um, posterior hippocampus of the taxi drivers was actually even greater on the right side. So if you get asked for a finding in relation to the taxi driver's hippocampi, you would be saying that there was greater right posterior hippocampal volume. That's important. Um, we also um, think that uh, the left um, is responsible for kind of, like I say, uh, memories, um, like episodes in your life, whereas the right does appear to be related to those, uh, you know, locations, spatial information. 
Now, what we think here is that the hippocampus probably works alongside other brain structures in its tasks. So we're not saying that it's only the hippocampus that's related to spatial information. Um, now, we don't know what actually occurs within the hippocampus that leads to this change, um, but we do know that there does seem to be this overall reorganisation of grey matter, so reorganisation of the circuits in the hippocampus. Um, so I suppose this leads us on then to question what other areas of the brain are we also able to rewire? So uh, that is Blake Morton Cooper's study. So just to make sure that you've paused the video at all the appropriate points and you've got some really thorough detailed notes.